Well, hello and welcome everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to have the SAO, the SAO collaboration webinar on tonight. My name is Dr. Nina Fuller-Chevelle and I am the co-chair for the British Society of Integrative Oncology alongside my colleague, Dr. Penny Kihayoglu. My background, if you don't know about me, I'm an Oxbridge trained medical doctor and scientist with over a decade's experience in integrative healthcare and additional training in nutrition, herbal medicine, yoga, and mindfulness. It's wonderful to have Lee and the team here. Thank you so much for coming along and giving us this wonderfully informative webinar. Take it away. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and we wish a warm welcome to all of you for joining us today for a lively discussion on yoga and cancer. My name is Lee Leibel, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the Yoga SIG for the Society for Integrative Oncology. I will be the moderator today. And on behalf of the Society for Integrative Oncology and the Yoga Special Interest Group, I thank Dr. Fuller Chevelle and the British Society for Integrative Oncology for the kind invitation for us to speak today. So we have 75 minutes together and a lot to unpack. This is meant to be an interactive, informal session, and we'll have plenty of time for a question and answer. And before I give you an overview of our topic and, and a little more detail on our format, I wanna recognize and welcome our four speakers and bring them front and center on the Zoom stage. They are all active members of the Yoga SIG, and I will give a formal um, introduction to them right before each of their presentations. But for now, I just want to recognize them. Dr. Lorenzo Cohen, who is with MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Ms. Smita Malaya, who works with Dr. Cohen at MD Anderson in Houston. Dr. Kelly Bethel at Maryland University of Integrative Health and Dr. Santosh Rao, who is uh, Banner Health MD Anderson in Gilbert, Arizona. So thank you all so much for uh, coming. To and uh, I wanna say on behalf of, of Yoga SIG and our speakers, that we honor the thousands of years of yogic tradition that originates in South Asia. And we share the sacred teachings with gratitude and respect. So our topic today is yoga in cancer care and really looking at the art and science of delivering yoga and yoga therapy at all stages of cancer care uh, across the, the continuum. And I think it's probably helpful if we just start out with uh, like a definition of yoga, just so we're all on the same page of what we are talking about today. And it's really the what some people would call the classic traditional yoga, Patanjali Ashtanga, Eight Paths of Yoga, which is the outer practices and the inner practices. The outer practices would be ethical, selfless behavior, breathing and movement, and then um, turning inward for the contemplative and the meditative practices, the mindfulness that leads to liberation and oneness. So that's sort of a, a working definition, what we're, what we're talking about. It's not uh, simply postural yoga that... Um, is so popular in the in the West. Uh, there's a strong and growing evidence base that shows that yoga can mitigate many of the physical and psychological side effects of cancer and treatment. It can improve cancer patient and survivor quality of life and positively impact clinical outcomes. And so Dr. Uh, Cohen is going to lead, lead us with looking at the latest research on yoga and cancer populations, as well as some guidelines and recommendations for yoga and cancer care. Uh, Ms. Malaya will look at the clinical application of yoga at all stages of care, including some best practices for designing a safe, effective, and inclusive yoga therapy session. Dr. Bethel will talk about the challenges of, um, or the different kinds of yoga professionals that there are and how to choose wisely and how to make uh, an appropriate referral for different kinds of cancer patients at different stages in their, in their care and treatment. And then Dr. Rao will talk about implementation and how to integrate yoga into clinic. With that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Cohen 
to talk about research in yoga and cancer. And he, Dr. Cohen is the Richard E. Haynes Distinguished Professor in Clinical Cancer Prevention and Director of the Integrative Medicine Program at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. He is also Distinguished Clinical Professor, Fudan University Cancer Hospital, Shanghai, China. Dr. Cohen is a founding member and past president of the Society for Integrative Oncology. He leads a team conducting NIH-funded research and delivers clinical care of integrative medicine practices. And this includes meditation, yoga, tai chi, massage, diet, exercise, acupuncture, and other strategies, including stress management, music therapy, journaling, and, and more, all aimed at the negative aspects of cancer treatment and improving quality of life and clinical outcomes. So with that, Dr. Cohen, please take it away. Thank you, Lee, and, and thank you everyone for uh, joining. It's great to connect with, with all of you in, in England across the pond, as, as we say, and you know, there's there's more downsides than good sides of, of COVID, of course, but this is one of the positives that we probably wouldn't be connecting like this uh, if we weren't all living in this this new world of a virtual connection. We would have gotten there eventually, but uh, not uh, as as soon as we have. Um, the other positive side, and, and Smitha will probably go into this in more detail, is is the ability to deliver some of the yoga practices via Zoom. Um, and all of this, of course, remains very new and, and we can get into both the pros and, and the cons of that. I'm gonna do a bit of a, a um, PowerPoint presentation to take us through primarily focusing on, on the evidence, what we know and, and some of the intangibles uh, that I'll close with that we need to perhaps uh, try and explore a, a bit better. So when it comes to the evidence, uh, there's a tremendous amount of evidence. And these are just three random uh, papers that actually I just pulled from, from the internet about 10 minutes ago, just showing, uh, you know, over time, not only um, a, a rich research base, but it's rich enough that warrants multiple uh, types of reviews, whether that's focusing on a disease that you see here, specifically breast cancer, more general yoga overall, or even looking at yoga uh, for specific symptoms. Um, and the research base is rich enough probably to do yoga for even specific symptoms within specific uh, cancer groups. Uh, a couple of uh, years ago now, uh, I worked with the team you see listed here and, and we wrote a, a systematic review for the journal Cancer looking at yoga specifically for symptom management in oncology, both split into um, yoga for patients undergoing active treatment as well as what would be classified as more that that survivorship group which was what was quite notable was this increase in the number of clinical trials specifically in it for yoga and oncology um, and this continues to to increase as there is in fact uh, certainly in, in North America and the U.S. in particular, more funding uh, from the NIH for this area and CCIH, our funding organization within the NIH that funds integrative medicine type of research, are particularly interested in mind-body practices and, and yoga being one of them. Um, here you kind of see a, a summary of uh, the primary outcomes, again, broken down into delivered during treatment, post-treatment, and then, of course, there were studies that had a combination of, uh, of, of patients. Um, the, the largest effects you can see compared to, uh, you know, these were all randomized clinical trials, was for uh, the largest number of studies was reporting physical benefits from yoga, but also, of course, 
um, some, some studies suggesting psychological benefit as well as uh, some biological outcomes, in particular the things like stress hormones or uh, aspects of uh, immune function. Most of this research today has actually been done in breast cancer patients or we see some of the modest benefits for uh, psychological well-being is often because uh, this patient population is extremely well adjusted when it comes to aspects of anxiety and depression. And to date, there hasn't been uh, an emphasis on recruiting uh, a, a particularly vulnerable population or more specifically trying to treat uh, a mental health condition with yoga. There have been some studies specifically of yoga for people who are experiencing sleep disturbances, yoga for people who are experiencing uh, chronic fatigue, uh, but less focused specifically on, for example, recruiting a, a group of patients who are experiencing depression um, and, and seeing whether yoga is helpful. So for a lot of these outcomes, uh, they were not necessarily the primary aim of the study, fatigue or depression, but we do see benefits uh, in, in all these multiple uh, domains. Um, in terms of a, a, a larger policy issue that's going on, uh, the WHO has been working with uh, individuals across the globe really to, to try and, as you can see here from the title, uh, develop benchmarks for training in yoga and a lot of discussion around of course, what is yoga? What is the difference between uh, teaching yoga versus yoga therapy and uh, trying to focus this more on the medical application? This is still a, a work in progress in a draft, but you know, hopefully something uh, like this that has input from uh, multiple countries, multiple players could ultimately result in uh, transforming our, our healthcare system. Um, because of this rich evidence base, uh, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, acronym NCCN, um, which is the an organization in, in the United States which is made up of all the comprehensive cancer centers. So I think there's now a, around 70 comprehensive cancer centers. So these are uh, cancer centers, uh, either standalone or within a medical system uh, that, are, that receive funding from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and they, uh, to, to be eligible for, for this type of, uh, uh, joining this type of organization, you need to have not only a focus on, on cancer treatment from a comprehensive manner, but also aspects of cancer uh, prevention are included. And then the NCCN group writes guidelines, as you see pictured here, and um, individuals from different institutions are part of these different panels. Uh, to develop guidelines, clinical guidelines, what the state of the art recommendations are. Um, and they have guidelines for breast cancer treatment, for all the different disciplines, for surgery, et cetera. There's all aspects of cancer care essentially will fall into guidelines and there's survivorship guidelines as well. Um, and, and here are specifically guidelines as they relate to symptom control. And I'll walk you through, uh, through a few of these most recent guidelines. And you see here in the 2019 guidelines for nausea uh, control, anti-emesis, nausea and vomiting, uh, that yoga is listed. You can also see some of the other integrative medicine uh, treatment modalities that have strong support, acupuncture, relaxation, hypnosis, et cetera. Uh, but in 2019 was the first time that, that yoga itself was uh, standing out as something that uh, should be considered for um, anti-emesis. Uh, here you see the most recent fatigue guideline and you see yoga listed there. 
at category one level, uh, along with other, of course, psychosocial and, and behavioral modalities, but yoga literally spelled out uh, separate from those other areas. Here you see the area for uh, anxiety, depression, trauma, distress, um, and yoga is listed in here along with other integrative therapies, mindfulness, meditation, imagery, hypnosis, et cetera. Uh, and here we see the pain guidelines where yoga is not uh, necessarily listed as a standout, but other aspects, of course, that are part of yoga, which of course is mindfulness, aspects of imagery, relaxation, uh, et cetera. Uh, but there has been, I think, less research specifically on yoga for cancer pain. And so they uh, have this more of this catch-all from a survivorship uh, perspective, uh, suggesting that yoga should, at, at a minimum, be considered for managing things like distress, uh, cognitive issues, memory, chemo, brain, etc. You're familiar with menopausal symptoms and uh, pain. Other uh, guidelines that exist in the U.S. come from uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and you see that listed here. Uh, they publish these guidelines in, in the JCO as well as on the ASCO website, um, and they will sometimes develop their own guidelines or they'll look at other organizations that have developed guidelines and choose to in, endorse them or endorse them with caveats, et cetera. Um, and so there was this partnership between the SIO and ASCO uh, and endorsing the SIO's clinical practice guidelines specifically for uh, integrative therapies after breast cancer treatment. Um, and we see here both meditation and yoga standing out for anxiety, stress reduction, depression, mood disorders, and overall quality of life. And, and we see it uh, essentially summarized here. This relationship between the SIO and uh, ASCO is, is um, been really codified now. And instead of SIO developing the guideline and then looking to ASCO for endorsement, uh, they are developing the guidelines in partnership, which is uh, such a huge uh, statement for essentially the, the acceptance now really of integrative medicine, uh, integrative oncology alongside uh, conventional care. Um, so those of you uh, in this meeting who are yoga practitioners and, and work directly with clients know that of course people feel better and they uh, function physically better, but there's also lots of other things uh, that we know are happening within the lives of, of yoga practitioners, particularly when they uh, get beyond just the introductory type of, of exposure to yoga. And these are things that unfortunately we don't tend to measure as effectively. We can measure benefit finding, uh, post-traumatic growth, those types of things. But this, this true inner transformation is something uh, that we do not measure well. Something else that we tend to not measure well is, is um, something that, that I've always seen and heard, uh, both uh, growing up being exposed to uh, yoga from childhood, but that uh, the, this concept of synergy between the different components of health and well-being. Uh, and I talk about this in, in my book, Anti-Cancer Living, where, you know, we may just focus on uh, this aspect when we're talking about yoga, meditation, relaxation, but we know that that influences our relationships, that uh, a, a yoga practitioners who's practicing on a regular basis, this will influence their sleep, but it will influence their eating habits. When you become more mindful of your body, you are more aware of how different foods make you feel, et cetera. Uh, and we've been doing research at, at MD Anderson that I would uh, classify more as uh, 
we call it comprehensive lifestyle change style of research, but it's really more yoga with a capital Y where we're talking about this, this full comprehensive uh, approach. And what's been quite remarkable in, in this research is that uh, the, none of the patients had a prior mind-body practice. And we, we introduced them, of course, to modifying their diet and exercise habits. But Smitha uh, developed with the Vyasa group uh, a yoga program that were, included meditation as well as asana, relaxation, pranayama, and incorporating it uh, not as a separate component, but it's just part of this whole lifestyle change. And we did qualitative interviews uh, with the participants um, to try and get beyond just the Likert scale quality of life types outcomes. And one of the themes that, that consistently emerged was this whole area about uh, lifestyle change. And uh, and, and the aspects of mindfulness. And a strong uh, indication of this was uh, a statement from one of the participants who uh, essentially said that um, through deep relaxation and the meditation practice that all these questions in her life that were kind of bottled up uh, were actually starting to flow. And she concluded by saying that she's never been in such deep thought about her life. Another, uh, and, and kind of the last point I wanna make here is, is the challenge that we often have, certainly in Texas, but other parts of, of the US of this concern about yoga as, as a, a religion. Um, and there was one patient in particular who um, we recruited for our, our comprehensive lifestyle study, whose husband was a pastor and she did a little bit of Googling uh, about yoga and, and Christianity. And if you Google that on the internet, you, you get some pretty horrific misinformation. Um, about uh, the the fact that that yoga is is trying to uh, proselytize Hinduism and uh, taking you down this dark path, which of course is is incorrect. And so Smitha very adeptly worked uh, with this patient around her faith, modified uh, the program to be aligned with her personal. Uh, beliefs. And uh, at the end of it, uh, the patient actually shared that she had never felt closer to God in her life mm. than when she was doing the mind-body practice led by Smitha, coming from, uh, of, of course, the Indian tradition. So these are, I just mentioned these two examples are, are the, the types of, of real transformations uh, that are not part of these meta-analysis, that are not part of these systematic reviews, this concept of yoga uh, with the capital Y. Uh, just a couple of last slides. There's uh, this book, if you're not aware of this book, please, uh, you know, it, it, it is sort of the definitive book on, on yoga uh, within medical systems. There's two chapters on uh, yoga and cancer because there's such a breadth of, of research in that area. We're working on the second edition now, uh, which should be out uh, hopefully at the end of, of 2022. Um, and I always like to close with uh, a quote from my grandmother, Vanda Scaravelli, uh, from her book, Awakening the Spine, where she says that yoga, it's a living process that changes moment by moment, watching when we eat, how we eat, when we walk, how we walk, what we say, how we say it, all these things are in us, and we must be passionately interested in them all. This is, you know, the concept of, of yoga with the capital Y beyond just the physical and getting more into uh, the metaphysical. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. That was really fantastic. And I think you make such a great point that it's yoga with a capital Y. And when we look at most of the yoga research in cancer care, it's, it's reducing yoga into different techniques. And what you're talking about is really the lifestyle change, the transformation and the, the synergy of, you know, the good night's sleep and the healthy uh, lifestyle and quitting smoking and uh, nutrition and, and exercise. And I, I think really um, we don't pay enough attention to yoga in its role in prevention and risk reduction for cancer occurrence and for metastases and, um, and for progression. So that was, that was really, um, that was really beautiful. Thank you very much. All right, next up is Ms. Smith Malaya, who is a senior mind body intervention specialist at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center's Integrative Medicine Program. And she works closely with Dr. Cohen. She holds a Master of Science in Yoga from Svyasa University in Bengaluru, where she's pursuing her PhD in yoga. On the clinic side, she works alongside other integrative medicine clinicians using yoga therapy with inpatients and outpatients going through cancer from diagnosis through to hospice and end of life. On the research side, she's involved in developing and teaching yoga research interventions for different cancer populations such as breast, lung, brain, and importantly, head and neck cancers. Um, and she is a contributor to the forthcoming book, Yoga Therapy Across the Cancer Care Continuum. So um, Ms. Malaya, please take it away. Thank you for being with us. Greetings, everyone. This is truly a honor to be representing and collaborating with the BSIO and the SIO from the United States. And each of the speakers, I know we have a few minutes, but then each of our topics and what we are trying to address has the uh, potential to speak probably for hours um, together. So I'll do my best in the next few minutes about, um, I'll probably take about 10 to 12 minutes to very briefly summarize um, the role of yoga uh, during the art yoga across the cancer care continuum. When we talk about care of continuum, it is, thank you, I can see the slides. Thank you, right, can go to the good. next slide. When we talk about journey through cancer and a lot of patients, um, you know, come up with this question of when to start yoga if you are going through, you know, cancer treatment or sometimes when we encourage patients to sign up for yoga studies or start yoga practice, the answer is, oh, once I'm done with the treatment, I'll start yoga. I'm going through cancer, I don't have time for yoga. These are all different answers that we hear from the patients. And when we talk about the continuum of care, it's an extended period. So with cancer, you can think it starts from diagnosis through treatment and end of treatment and even you know, the scope of yoga during the last moments at the end of life. And again, this is not one straight road from one to another, but then we understand and see that patients may have relapse or they might be at remission and at no evidence of disease for a certain time. They may go back to treatment and there is, you know, this uh, cycle that they may have to go back and forth. So when we talk about, you know, journey and applying yoga through this continuum, the point is that there is scope of yoga to be added from at the point of diagnosis all the way through, you know, end of life. Please, let's, let's go to the next slide. At diagnosis, um, we have heard stories. I have heard stories many from many patients who talk about how the delivery of news of, you know, uh, diagnosis of cancer itself was so traumatic and they may, you know, end up with that, the way that the news was delivered. And what do you do? What are the next steps? Is it, you know, um, in the classical stress response, is it freeze? Is it, you know, fight or flight? So yoga can be a friend while patients are still processing this diagnosis to what we call as, you know, moving the shock and even the fear of cancer. Not only the fear of cancer at the stage of diagnosis, but even through the fear of recurrence that happens even when patients are done with their treatments. So we can use yoga to work in developing what we call as a strong 
sankalpa, a resolve. And we see that patients feel empowered by this and what we call as things I can control and I cannot control. So patients feel they have more tools to use as they go through their cancer journey. One other area that is important between diagnosis and the start of treatment, which is gaining traction and attention of a lot of medical providers as well as patients, is the scope of rehabilitation. A lot of us might have heard about rehabilitation, which is after the fact of treatment, after the fact something has happened, we go back to provide rehabilitation, which is very important. But there's also scope for prehabilitation, which is basically a time and practice of enhancing the patient's functional or overall capacity before a medical procedure. This is typically used in surgical procedures, like a lot of orthopedic surgeons and surgeries have published data and reviews on this. In cancer, it is a fairly new concept, but then the rehabilitation you know, teams are picking up prehab and what we call as enhanced recovery you know, um, before the start of the treatment, through the treatment, as well as in the post-treatment. This can potentially help patients actually improve their outcomes. So we have done certain studies. A lot of the research that we see is during treatment. And what we see is even in the initial stages of treatment, if patients can be recruited or approached for yoga and they're given yoga, the side effects of the treatment or even the recovery period can be enhanced. So a great uh, you know, area for all of us to focus on which can help even in their long-term survival. Next slides. During treatment, as I mentioned, a lot of research that we see that, that uh, Dr. Cohen was also focusing on, there is much more evidence in this area because of actually the side effects of the cancer treatment. And here there is a list, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, one of the understanding um, for us is one, uh, side effect of the treatment actually leading to other forming this vicious cycle. Patients are fatigued, so they can stop their physical activity, and lack of physical activity can increase their fatigue, can worsen their physical and mental outcomes, and, you know, increase depression, anxiety, and things like that. So when we start addressing one of these symptoms, it can in turn correct the others. Dr. Cohen mentioned about sleep. Can we improve insomnia, sleep disturbances in patients so that they have better energy during the day to be physically active so it can improve other functionalities? So this is one of the things that patients do ask about. Does yoga cure my cancer? That is not the goal. Yoga is an adjuvant you know, during um, the cancer treatment so that patients can improve, you know, reduce their symptom burden, improve their physical and mental health. And finally, respond to the important treatments of cancer itself. Adherence to treatment is one of the very important areas that actually yoga uh, can play a huge role. When we talk about treatment, another thing that does come to mind is the family. So at MD Anderson, we were fortunate, again, under the leadership of Dr. Lorenzo Cohen, uh, Dr. Catherine Milbury, who is a social psychologist herself, we did experiments, we did studies where we included caregivers. When it comes to caregiver, next slide, please. When it comes to caregiver, the literature suggests that caregivers can have equal, sometimes even higher distress and symptom burden than the care cancer patients themselves. And with cancer, we know that the caregiving is a huge burden on them, even though a lot of you know, caregivers enjoy and feel privileged to be able to care for their loved ones, their health is as important because if the caregivers are under distress, it can impact the patients. And again, the vicious cycle of you know, the burden continues. So with the studies that we did, we did, developed and designed yoga programs where both the patient and the caregiver were you know, included in the program. They did their yoga together, which resulted, one, it was, you know, all these was basically feasibility studies because there's no literature in this area. So not only these were feasible to be you know, doing yoga with the patient and the caregiver together, but it improved not just the patient's you know, physical, mental health, but also we, had, we saw significant improvements in sleep and mental health for the caregiver themselves. So again, uh, wonderful feedback and a great area for us as yoga therapists and even for researchers to consider to include patient and the caregiver. The next slide. 
conclusion of treatment and end of life. One of the things that patients typically hear at the end of treatment is, see you in three months, see you in six months, or see you in a year for another follow-up. So this is the time where a lot of patients are basically adjusting for probably living with chronic disease, adjusting for the new normal of what is to come. And not to mention many patients or cancer survivors have a lot of lingering symptoms that is unaddressed. Yoga is the great add-on. You know, uh, researchers like Dr. Karen Mustin and others have, you know, contributed to a lot of literature in this area. And trauma of going through cancer treatment is actually one of the least addressed side effects after treatment. There is trauma that can be pre-existing, which can amplify during cancer treatment, but there can be trauma from the treatment itself, which can be addressed as well. And survivors often, you know, report a dramatic increase in depression, anxiety, and PTSD symptoms, which yoga, again, is a great, you know, tool to be added on to improve. And grief, of, grief and end of life, again, are areas that, can, that yoga can uh, improve, again, when it comes to end of life or some of these um, um, special, fragile uh, times that patients are going through. Treatment is something that is, uh, sorry, the training is something that is a must. So the uh, therapists or teachers who are trying to help can be better equipped with tools and techniques to support patients and families during this time. The next slide. Safety precautions and contraindications. Next slide. So Dr. Cohen talked about standardization and other things that are in books. So most importantly, when we talk about yoga therapy, yoga therapy is not just yoga postures, which is mostly common in the West, but you can see the list of techniques that go down. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are all you know, techniques that come from the traditional books and understanding from yoga. Next slide, Steve. Need for training, not just for knowing the practices. Again, that also you know, uh, raises the question of how much of yoga teachers and therapists know all the different techniques that are available, but also for the sake of safety precautions. One important principle that we all need to work with is do no harm. Let safety be your top priority for the patients. And that starts basically knowing your patient and client. It can be fitness level, blood counts, bony metastasis, cardiopulmonary status, infectious disease status, and other things. There are many measurements that can be used in this area. I've just put in uh, on the edge of the slide an ECOG. ECOG is such just one measure. Different cancer categories can use different measurements as such to see the patient's fitness level and what can be appropriate during cancer treatment because they are much more fragile during the treatment rather than once they get into no evidence of disease and survivorship in the longer term. Next slide, please. Safety precautions and contraindications con you know, continued on different medical devices that patients can have as they go through treatment. It can be feeding tube, ostomy, drains, or even ports for that matter. Um, feelings, emotions, and body image, not just the physical restrictions, but the, newly, the new normal that patients are adjusting to that can be related to body image or the trauma of cancer itself. And then with yoga, uh, you know, almost common sense is you know, yoga in heat or the hygiene, especially with COVID, we have seen this increased awareness with you know, hygiene and social distancing all applies. And then you see the edge of this slide basically has an exertion scale, which can be used while we're working with patients to see what can be exerting. You may see that a patient looks fine, fit and normal, but does pranayama, which is you know, breathing techniques and some breath manipulations, does that cause exertion in certain patients? Some of these scales can be very handy in actually measuring what patients are going through and especially useful in research studies so that we can really gather information and effect sizes for larger populations. The next slide. Other considerations. Many patients may benefit from private one-on-one -on -one sessions versus group sessions. Again, everything has its own benefits. So group sessions can help improve their social health, connecting to other patients. But if the patients are under isolation, they're recovering from 
certain surgeries, a group practice may not you know, meet their needs. And importantly, cancer focused groups versus just other groups uh, which are designed for wellness. So it's important that we look at these considerations when designing and teaching. And then smaller group practices might serve well, you know, a group of breast cancer patients versus combining breast cancer, head and neck, you know, other blood cancer types. And with COVID, you know, one of the gifts of COVID is that the tele yoga sessions have exploded. Again, it comes with limitations that you may not be able to assess or see the patients fully, but if deemed appropriate, we have seen that with MD Anderson's practice, we are able to reach patients across the country without any limitations because of these tele yoga sessions versus in person. So I think with that, I'll stop and hand it over back to you and we will continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Ms. Malaya. That was a really beautiful and elegant presentation. And you, you really highlight the, the importance of yoga professionals having advanced training to work with medically fragile populations. And, and another important point is that there are opportunities for yoga professionals to work in, in many different areas. As you said, caregiving, working with caregivers, working with symptom clusters, working with uh, behavior and adherence to treatment. So thank you. That's a, a very and very important presentation. And I, I look forward to some questions uh, at the end. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to Dr. Kelly Bethel. And Dr. Bethel is a physical therapist, certified yoga therapist, and a registered yoga instructor. She is director of yoga therapy experiential learning and an instructor at Maryland University of Integrative Health. She has over 28 years of experience as a physical therapist, treating adult and pediatric clients, and focusing on neurologic injuries and disease, as well as working with patients with cancer. Clinically, she provides physical therapy and yoga therapy to patients, and she is a contributor to the comprehensive textbook, Yoga Therapy Foundations, Tools, and Practice. Dr. Bethel, it's all yours. Helps if I unmute. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Um, it's an honor to be here today. I'm going to follow up similar to, to what uh, Smino just shared is, you know, it's very clear based on what um, the, her lecture could have probably be, that 15 minutes could probably be hours and hours of educational training around um, the precautions and contraindications that we need to be aware of when we are working with someone that's in the cancer continuum. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So just give me a second while I pull up my PowerPoint. Um, it'll, you just got to give me a second. Sure. Let me just oh, go to my slideshow. So as, as I said, um, I'm, I'm a physical therapist and a certified yoga therapist, and I really have been working in yoga therapy um, primarily since about 2007, um, less, not so much seeing patients from the physical therapy perspective. So I want to be really clear because sometimes people are like, oh, you're a PT, you're doing PT with yoga. I'm, I'm doing yoga therapy and, and I need to be clear. And I can, you know, as we have conversations, I can kind of give you examples of what that would look like if I was practicing PT versus if I was practicing yoga therapy, but that's probably a conversation for a slightly different time. Um, as we're coming into this discussion now around education, um, there really is a role for all of us, um, whether you're a yoga teacher or a yoga therapist. And I want to be really clear about that. The IOIT has a great, um, let me just move some things around on my screen. The IOIT, the International Association of Yoga Therapists, um, that is the one that credentials the CIYTs, um, has a great public um, facing website, uh, yogatherapy.health. And on this site, they're very clear, and, and we're all very clear as yoga therapists that all yoga is potentially therapeutic and healing. And that being a yoga therapist is not um, better than being a yoga teacher. We have different, we have different scopes um, and they all have a place in cancer care. So this was an article that was published in Yoga Therapy Today um, entitled Shared Foundations for Practice. And yoga therapy nests inside the larger yoga um, paradigm. So it's neither separate nor greater. It's a part of yoga. Um, and so as we start having these conversations around educational standards and um, 
developing best practice guidelines. Again, it's not that one's better than the other. We're coming from different scopes of practice and different levels of training. As we've kind of talked about and alluded to, really, there is a misconception that the practice of yoga is all about stretching and movement. And, and when I, um, prior to coming to MUIH, I was the clinical director at the Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And we had programs within Greenbaum and um, the Maryland Proton Center. And the question I always got from the oncologist was like, well, I don't want to refer my patient because I don't want them standing on their head. Um, so, you know, there's this misconception that what yoga, that yoga is really about stretching and movement and yoga, yoga therapy practices, they can include breath practice like pranayama. They may include asana, but often, you know, especially some of our, our patients who are um, in active treatment, movement may be contraindicated um, for them. So things like meditation or mindfulness, um, yoga philosophy, also referred to sometimes in the literature as lifestyle, are all part of yoga but it doesn't mean that they're going to be in every practice. Some I've had clients who only want to work on guided meditation or develop a meditation practice so that they can go into um, radiation. When we were doing proton, they could lay on the table for 15 minutes and not move. Um, and so there's a lot of applications. Um, and again, we'll I'll talk a bit about yoga therapy, but it's not all about asana. And I think we've kind of said that again, um, Smita had the cancer continuum and there really is a place for all of us um, in this um, cancer continuum. I'm a big fan of prehab, obviously coming from the PT background, we prehab is super important. Um, and I actually have a, you know, a client now that we've been talking about um, the prehab piece. And I think going into, and prehab is not, I will go back to Dr. Cohen's point. It all is, it's not just the yoga, it's also the eating and the sleep and the, all of those components, component, components combined are really important. Um, but again, so a little bit, I, I recognize that um, having given similar lectures before when we're looking at um, US versus more of a socialized medicine, um, we're, you know, in the US, we're not socialized medicine. So we, here's where we're gonna start seeing some of the differences. Um, in the US, a registered yoga teacher typically completes 200 hours of a generalized yoga training. It may be lineage specific um, and we have, lots of different lineages in yoga. Um, it can, the Yoga Alliance requires 100 hours of techniques, training and practice, 20 hours of anatomy and physiology, 30 hours of ethics, lifestyle and philosophy, and 50 hours of teaching mythology and practicum. They are getting ready to switch and move to a slightly more, um, switching some of these hours around. I think anatomy is gonna go to like 30 or 40 hours, but again, it's all 200 hours. In a yoga class, really the focus is on the teacher. The teacher is the one delivering um, the, the yoga intervention. It's really what the teacher chooses to be the focus for that class. So even in survivorship, the teacher may, again, choose a specific theme or mantra, but it's, it's really at the teacher's discretion what they're, what they're working on. The students are relying on the teacher's instruction and the scope of practice is broad. And typically a yoga teacher's knowledge, and I'm, I'm gonna stay just with the RYT for here, is often limited and generalized. So they don't necessarily have the advanced training to know how to work with chronic um, medical conditions or special populations. Um, the teacher really rep replicates the yoga tools that they were taught either by their, um, within their lineage or by their teacher. The governing body of yoga in the US is Yoga Alliance, and that is a volunteer registry, but I will argue that it's pretty much the gold standard. I know I would never hire, um, when, when I had a studio, I would not hire anyone that was not Yoga Alliance certified. Um, so it really, is, it really is the gold standard, even though it's a volunteer registry. Yoga therapy um, really is a little bit different. It's the specific applications of yoga tools, the breath, the asana, the mindful techniques, and more really to address the individual's physical, mental, and emotional needs. One of the biggest things about yoga therapy and yoga therapists is we assess everyone. Even in a group setting, we are assessing everyone individually. And the treatment really um, is designed with, with being patient or client-centered. Um, for those in the medical field that aren't familiar with the yogic um, assessments, we, we often, I, I work through the koshas. Um, but it's very similar to the biopsychosocial spiritual approach to wellness. So we're looking at that whole person, similar to Lorenzo's example about um, religion. You know, the, I've had a lot of clients where their um, 
faith is extremely important to their healing. And so things like incorporating things like wrote, saying the rosary or specific Bible passages as their, as their mantra um, are ways that we've incor I've incorporated the client's spirituality into their, into their treatment. The therapists work to meet the patient where they are. We address the patient's goals or the client's goals. And, and we use that, I use that term interchangeably. Um, when I'm out of, out in the community, it's a client, but when I'm working in the hospital, they're patients. Um, so really it's about the client's goals. And like I've said before, I've had clients that come in and maybe they do need to work on balance or maybe they do need to do some physical movement and they're cleared to movement. But again, their goal is not that at that point, they really want to, um, they have a different need um, that they wanna focus on. So we're gonna consider any limitations. And again, then really also taking into account their medical issues. Um, cancer, is, especially active treatment is extremely complicated. Um, and it's really important that you have that, that background of knowing, you know, what are the blood levels? Are, is there metastasis? Those type of things. Um, respiratory status, are we radiating the heart? Um, lots of really important factors that are, need to be considered when we're developing um, a yoga uh, plan of care for someone. So really in yoga therapy, the focus is on the patient's goals. We're empowering the patient and we're working with the patient on their journey together um, towards their process and their goals. A yoga therapist does have a very defined scope of practice and has to demonstrate clinical mastery. One of my jobs at MUIH is I run the senior year student clinic. So those students are in clinic for nine months, um, actually seeing patients, um, developing plans of care, assessing those type things. The yoga therapists have been trained in a variety of tools and techniques, and really they're using um, and learning what their appropriate appropriateness is to based on the assessment. So not every yoga tool is appropriate for every person. Um, and we can work individually in small groups, but again, going back to the assessment, it's not just having everyone show up. The clients are assessed prior to coming into, um, into the group setting. We have in-depth training within the IAYT that gives us the CIYT credential. Um, it is 800 to 1,000 hours, and that is both didactic and clinical um, programs are moving towards master's and doctorate degrees. The IAYT is moving towards an international board exam um, expected probably in the late 2022. It's in beta testing now. At present in the U.S., we are not licensed, but we do have a number of CIYTs that hold U.S. licenses. I think the last time I looked, it was between 28 and 30 percent of CIYTs had additional licenses. Um, hold a, held additional board certifications. That can be a blessing and a curse. Um, as a PT, I can't do everything. Um, I'm held to my, my board standard of a PT. So there's some things like nutrition that I can't necessarily give advice around, um, but I certainly can refer people out. And for um, CIYT is the governing body is the International Association of Yoga Therapists. Again, it is a voluntary registry, but they are essentially the standard for CIY, they are the standards for certified um, CIYTs. So I'm gonna um, put this out here because I feel very strongly and very passionate about this. Whether a yoga teacher or a yoga therapist, everyone needs more training in cancer. So even just having a CIYT is an entry level degree and really to work in the cancer continuum, we really you really do need more um, training, which um, I've got to move, hang on, I've got to move everyone over. You're all on my slide, hang on, give me here. Um, but the problem is, is that we at this point, we really don't have best, practice, best practices, standards, and education. So we know that research shows that yoga offers tremendous benefits to both patients and survivors of cancer, but really we don't have a knowledge of um, what is best practice. So we know it affects the whole body, the mind, and the spirit. We know that it affects the body systems. But when that is applied to an oncology patient, whether in treatment or survivorship, the induced changes could be harmful. Um, and really the therapist has to have, the therapist or the yoga teacher has to have an understanding of um, what the possible changes, is, changes are. They need to modify, may need to modify and also account for any of these effects. So currently we have no universal best practices for yoga. We have no specific um, yoga specific precautions and contraindications that are universally agreed upon. Um, we don't have standards in education and training of yoga and yoga therapy professionals in oncology care. You know, having been in the PT realm for a very long time, when we first, when I went to PT school, like even that has changed. We were originally told that if, if um, patients were undergoing chemotherapy, they 
couldn't have PTA. And so now, you know, 30 years later, now we're realizing they need to move. So I think really to develop these standards, we need the best of um, best practices that's going on in, in our allopathic fields and our best practices that are going on in our um, yoga and yoga therapy fields to really come up with these standards. So the SIO and the Yoga Special Interest Group have begun a multi-institutional, multidisciplinary working group beginning to look at um, yoga parameters. What we're looking for is to help make rec recommendations to guide practices in yoga, to, inf um, to influence curriculums and help establish educational competencies, and really to also provide public-facing information for, the, for yoga and cancer, both for the patient, the survivors, the families, but also for healthcare providers. Um, so that everyone, everyone knows the benefits of yoga and also we can keep them safe. We are going to start with breast cancer, um, as it's been alluded to throughout this presentation. That's the one area that we have a lot of research in. And so we are actually going to start with breast cancer. Um, it is believed ideally in the cancer continuum that yoga teachers, at least in the U.S., based on, on the qualifications, um, have that they would um, really are best suited to work with survivors in the community setting and also prevention, obviously. Um, you know, I, I, we can all argue yoga is, is a um, preventative um, for cancer, but at minimum have a 200 hour RYT. Our preference is probably gonna wind up being more towards the, the 300 or 500 hour RYT. Definitely additional yoga and oncology training. For the yoga therapist graduating from an accredited IAYT school that they are a CIYT. Um, graduating from a school does not guarantee you a CIYT. There's an application process, a code of ethics, those type of things, so that they are CIYTs. And again, they will need additional training to work with the oncology population. And really where we see CIYTs um, being tremendous benefit is really that acute oncology patient, whether that's inpatient, outpatient um, treatments. So we're just getting started. It's going to take time to complete. Once it's completed, um, we're hoping that you know we will continue to see the benefits of yoga um, across the cancer continuum and also help us to provide safe and effective treatments. Just really quickly on referrals, because I know we're starting to run out of time. Um, things to think about when you're referring a patient to um, a yoga or a yoga therapist, um, that there is, where are they in the continuum? Um, do, are they, are they in survivorship? Are they in more of an acute oncology stage? Um, complications and comorbidities, even sometimes some people in survivorship may need um, to work with someone that has a little more knowledge and that's that, um, that traditional yoga teacher may not have. And then again, in-person versus telehealth. And I will um, anecdotally argue that telehealth has been an incredible tool um, for oncology and yoga. And I've seen also the benefits of being able to deliver um, telehealth visits for people in oncology. Some, if you're looking for more information on yoga therapy or also looking for yoga therapist, um, highly recommend the IAYT's front-facing website, yogatherapy.health. You can also look at the International Association of Yoga Therapists, um, their website to find uh, yoga therapists and more on yoga therapy. Um, I always put my email, so um, feel free to jot it down if you have questions or um, I don't know everyone, but there's a, there's a big enough continuum and there's some very active um, private Facebook groups that we can post if you're looking for a yoga therapist and they have international, um, some international connections. Um, so I'm always happy to help post and connect and see and help find someone that could work for your patient. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bethel. That was a great presentation, um, really illustrating that there's a role for all yoga professionals, professionals um, at each stage of care. Certainly uh, a yoga therapist with more oncology training would be appropriate for an acute oncology setting, whereas a survivor who is healthy uh, in the community doesn't have any comorbid conditions could work with a, uh, a highly trained, high quality yoga teacher. Um, Thanks so much for that, Dr. Bethel. And uh, now we're going to bring on Dr. Santosh Rao. He is the medical director at the James M. Cox Foundation Center for Cancer Prevention and Integrative Oncology at Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center 
in Gilbert, Arizona. He is also a practicing medical oncologist and his focus is on genitourinary cancers. And Dr. Rao is the president-elect of the Society for Integrative Oncology. He will take the reins uh, next uh, October at the International Conference. So Dr. Rao, it's all yours. Thanks, Lee. Um, just as a, for, for the audience, I don't think you can speak into the, into the panel, but if you want to ask questions or answer any of the questions, I'm going to make this as interactive as I can. Also, for the rest of our panel members, <clears throat> please feel free to chime in as I ask some questions that are more thought-provoking than anything else. If you can bring up my, uh, my slides. An idea, I'm, I'm a, a director of an integrative oncology program. You know, we have had uh, yoga as a core part of our program for many years, but we've also had our challenges during COVID. And so I'm just kind of approaching this from that perspective. Um, I'll wait for a second. It's coming, it's coming. Here it, here it is, I had to uh, re rewind it. Okay. okay, next slide. So I think we've already heard how, you know, yoga is a really core mind, body and body-based modality in integrative oncology. It's very commonly available and used in integrative oncology in many cancer centers. Its uh, use in the public is also increasing both in the US and internationally. We've heard about some of the evidence and guidelines for all the symptoms that yoga can help alleviate. And also it can be specified and modified for specific populations. And you may see different yoga classes offered for specifically for elderly. Some incorporate chair yoga. Uh, you know, we have often had a separate chair yoga class, for example, for those who may need uh, a less kind of uh, uh, aggressive form of yoga or less athletic. Um, we talked about breast a little bit, and there have been modifications in specific classes and books on yoga for breast cancer. And there are some places who do inpatient yoga as well, such as Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Next slide. Um, yoga is often also an introduction to meditation. You know, so I think there's this big, broad kind of category of mind-body, which incorporates things like guided imagery, transcendental meditation, mindfulness-based stress reduction. You will of, often see yoga instructors who are trained in MBSR uh, or who are the people in a cancer center who may do group or individualized instruction on meditation. So they become kind of crossover uh, individuals who often kind of take a very broad uh, area of responsibility, not only to teach yoga, but sometimes to help manage stress through mind-body concepts. Um, and then, you know, often they can also introduce the concept of circadian rhythm and concepts of Ayurveda as well. So one of my questions up front is what type of meditation or mind-body practice works best in a cancer setting? And are yoga instructors the best people to introduce meditation? Uh, I would argue that they're very good people to introduce this because they uh, have personal experience, and as they develop this experience in a clinical setting, they've worked with a lot of folks. Um, but this is one of those kind of gray areas where it's applied uh, differently in different places, you know. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts from the audience on that question. I think it depends what kind of setting we are in, Santosh, really. I think, um, like you said, sometimes if you're coming in for um, yoga therapy, for example, it's a wonderful place to introduce meditation. I think sometimes also we need to be aware of the fact that you don't need to be a yoga teacher to, of course, introduce any of those things. And we've got MBSI and MBCT programs, which are, of course, very well structured. It can introduce these practices in a way that exists outside of yoga so i think in a way for me the more the merrier right the more people we can have who are qualified and well versed in using meditation mindfulness techniques and can use them with cancer patients effectively the, the better yeah and i think this gets into as a role of a director you have to formulate a team and how that works you know there's co components of that team the way i think about it and in bigger cancer centers you'll have more people but often, if you have a limitation in numbers of individuals who really are part of your core team, you have to figure out who can, you know, target what aspects of integrative care. So it may be a psychologist. You know, there have been times where our psychologists will run mindfulness programs. 
it may be a yoga instructor. And I would argue that yoga instructors are really core because they have the ability to target not only body-based practice, but also mind-body as well. Next slide. So some practical considerations we've already talked about. Um, one is, you know, guidelines and safety standards. I think that, you know, you know, I think that's really important. You know, we have some guidelines and safety standards for other integrative modalities. Uh, as we get more precise with how, with how we're applying yoga, I think safety standards guidelines would be broadly applicable. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, I think that some of the other practical considerations is what style of yoga that's already been brought up. Cultural beliefs, which has already been brought up as well, and you know changes in different locations. Um, are you what model are you going to use? Are you going to charge people? Or are you going to offer it for free? Are your yoga instructors salaried or contracting? In our center, they were contracted. Timing. Um, I think often we see yoga classes offered throughout the middle of the day, and um, that's not necessarily how. We practice in India, especially uh, when somebody's doing it on their own. What uh, effect does that have? Um, you know, our, what's, what's the role of the class? Is it more to engage somebody in a home practice? So one of the questions is what models have worked in a cancer setting? Sorry. That's okay. Um, if anybody has any thoughts on that, you know, I, I think that some of the different models are include contracting, there are some places where there is a neighborhood uh, yoga offering. And obviously in more kind of rural settings, it may be a YMCA, it may be uh, a, a neighborhood or community center where you're referring out. Um, and as I said, the larger centers tend to have their own yoga instructors. So a lot of that has to depend on, on what you have available. Uh, I think the other thing is uh, you know online, which we'll get to in a second. So we'll get to this uh, challenges next, okay? Finding trained yoga instruct instructors. As somebody who has hired yoga instructors, a lot of it comes down to experience. You know, that's really what we're looking for. Space and feasibility. I think this also depends on where you live. Um, you know, is it easy for people to come for yoga? You know, I want people to relax. I want people to come when, you know, often if they can. So it has to be a space that's inviting where it's easy for people to come. If they have to drive 30, 45 minutes, kind of defeats the purpose sometimes. You know, so how popular is it for people to come to that space? I think somebody's mentioned tele-yoga, which I think is, uh, you know, a good offering and something COVID has brought up, and then group or individual. Um, and then, you know, it's been brought up in our practice, processing of emotions and those with real mood disorders, depression, et cetera. What's the liability? Uh, when do you draw the line? on uh, when yoga, the yoga instructor kind of feels a little bit out of their comfort zone. Um, and then how do you implement yoga in poor neighborhoods when they may not have access to the internet? I think this is something that we all need to work together. Um, so I'll, I'll offer that as a question. How do we offer yoga in different settings, especially in poor neighborhoods or rural settings to meet all people's needs? So I can address just a little bit um, from, from working for the Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, which is literally in, you know, um, in an underserved population. Obviously, our cancer patients come from all over in different, different walks of life. But um, our yoga therapists were um, provided, it was part of the standard of care. So it was provided as part of their treatment. Um, we, the yoga therapist would go in. Um, we had a mind body specialist who was an art therapist. We, we would actually go in and work um, within the uh, cancer um, in the um, infusion center. Um, we could see clients, you know, privately um, weren't really off. We weren't offering group classes because it truly was yoga therapy. So, um, and we were there when the, we had someone on every day. So um, they, for a certain, for the, the period of time where there was a large where most clients came in um we've done stuff i was part of uh maryland proton we actually had an entire um treatment team uh that considered of considered of a an np massage therapist nutrition uh yoga therapist art therapist um we our treatment our payment models have been varied um we've had um foundation um we've actually been part of the marketing plan um, because in proton treatment is in the U.S. Um, 
is big money. And so if a patient chose to come there, it was bundled services. So we were actually part of, of the marketing plan and that's how they paid for all of us. Um, for, so, you know, so there's a lot of different ways. Some of that gets into what's U S versus socialized med. Like, I'm not sure those would translate well, but I would argue that we've thought of every different possible scenario. Um, I get paid through joint commission because I'm provide community outreach, community outreach. So I'm part of the joint commission. That's how um, one of the survivorship group programs got paid um, for because I met their joint commission requirement for community outreach. So there's a lot of different models. It's really about what the administration needs and how can we navigate that. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so COVID obviously has, uh, you know, brought up a lot of issues and whether people actually are satisfied with online. Uh, I think there's some evidence that some people are and some people would prefer to come in person. You know, it does bring up some, you know, uh, questions about safety and how you're adapting. Um, but, you know, I think that it's a good modification. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of issues with hiring yoga therapists during COVID-19 and something for us to, to you know, consider. I'm going to move on. Yoga has obviously been mainstream through much of the world. Uh, SIO is working on guidelines and safety standards. Um, I just joined a NIH NCI working group working with uh, India on um, Ayurveda and yoga and enhancing collaboration, identifying research gaps. This is all very exciting. Next step, next slide. So in the future, I think we need to focus on collaborative research with you know, people like Lorenzo have been engaged for many years personalizing the approach to yoga and, you know, perhaps specificity for diagnoses and conditions. I've heard people talk about biomarkers to follow effects of yoga, um, you know, online, virtual uh, ways to implement. Next slide. And then just as a plug, uh, our uh, next uh, conference for the International Conference for Society for Integrative Oncology, Dr. Cohen's gonna be one of our keynote speakers, will be October 20th to 22nd, in Scottsdale, Arizona, it's hybrid, which means in-person or virtual, and we'll be accepting abstracts and workshop proposals early in 2022. So thank you. I know we went a little bit over, but I'll stop there. I want to thank all of our speakers, our four speakers, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Bethel, Ms. Malaya, and Dr. Rao. Um, really fantastic, and it's, it's such a pleasure to be able to work with you all every day uh, it, in the Yoga Special Interest Group. Thank you all so much for attending, all of our uh, attendees today. And thank you to Dr. Fuller Chevelle for the kind invitation and to BSIO. We look forward to uh, a really uh, wonderful and warm partnership moving forward. I hope this is the first of many more opportunities to, to share and interact. And I will turn it over to Dr. Fuller Chevelle. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Lee and team. That was amazing. Such a helpful webinar. And I want to thank you all for your time. I know you're all busy people. So it's been wonderful to have you share all your experience and knowledge with us. And yes, there is going to be a joint SAO BSAO membership. So people will be able to top up and become members of both organizations if you're already a member. Or if you're newly joining us, you'll be able to, jo to join us um, on both levels. So there'll be an information email coming out in the next uh, couple of days on that, which would be wonderful. And we look forward to, again, hopefully cross-pollinating on our conferences and our future content going forward. So thank you and have a wonderful evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.